to welcome all our guests this evening um, and particularly thank our host, uh, John Nagel, who is the ninth headmaster of the Haverford School. I would also like to uh, thank our co-chairs of our mainline series, Eileen Rosenau, Jim Gately, and John Piasecki. Um, we have a great, great program this evening to talk about East Asia and the economic situations. And I will turn it over to our host for the evening, uh, John Nagel, uh, but first tell you thank you for coming and tell you how much we appreciate your continuing support for FPRI. Thanks, Raleigh. And uh, um, Raleigh, it, it seems now like 100 years ago when you gave your great talk uh, at the Haverford School um, on, on sort of the, the spycraft and, and your remarkable career. And um, goodness gracious, I wish I were welcoming all of you to the Haverford School. Sadly, I'm not. I'm welcoming you to my study. Uh, my coworkers, Maggie, my principal dog, and Sparky, my backup dog, also welcome you. They may make an appearance along the way. Let me compliment FPRI on, on choosing a topic of such uh, remarkable relevance um, at, a, at a time. They, they couldn't have known it was going to be this important. And uh, uh, so we're delighted to have you here to discuss the quest for economic success in East Asia, how economic and trade policies help or hinder in a world of coronavirus, and both of our speakers are going to discuss the coronavirus world. Uh, our first speaker is Shihoko Goto. She is the Deputy Director for Geoeconomics and the Senior Northeast Asia Associate at the Wilson Center's Asia Program. Shihoko is a leading expert on economics and politics in Japan, Taiwan, and South Korea, as well as US policy in the region. A seasoned journalist and analyst, she spent 10 years reporting from Tokyo and Washington, for Dow Jones and United Press International on the global economy, international trade, and Asian markets and politics. She previously worked for the World Bank and has been awarded fellowships from the East-West Center and the Knight Foundation. Uh, she got her master's degree from Waseda University, Japan, and her bachelor's degree in modern history from Trinity College, Oxford. And, and uh, maybe we'll have uh, Shihoko start, and then I'll introduce Jacques. Uh, before Jacques speaks. So Eli, if you'd be so kind, maybe if you could transfer the microphone to Shihoko. Great. Well, thank you very much, um, John, for that very kind introduction. And thank you, FPRI, um, for inviting me here tonight. I know that um, this wasn't um, exactly what we were planning to do. The idea, I believe, is to have a very nice um, event at um, the Haverford School, and then for us to meet and mingle, and then exchange views um, after socializing a bit. Unfortunately, things do not go as planned, um, but I'm, I'm very glad we can all get together in this way, in this new reality that we find ourselves in social distancing. Uh, the title of this talk um, was framed before the pandemic, and it was um, really to highlight um, I, I believe that the title was Quest for Economic Success, and does trade help or hinder um, growth in Asia in particular? And the plan had been to really talk about the changing uh, trade landscape um, in Asia in particular, and talk about the changes in trade relations between the United States and China, how that's impacting growth both in on, on both sides of the Pacific, um, talk about um, great power competition, and talk about bilateral versus multilateral interest, both in trade agreements and in, in dealing with issues of mutual interest. I would like to conclude perhaps with those, um, what I was expected to address first, but I'd like to start today by talking a little bit about what's heavily on everyone's mind at the moment, and that is uh, this ongoing pandemic. Um, and how has the coronavirus impacted trade relations between Asia and the United States in particular? And um, what does it mean um, today? How
Shahoko, we've lost you, I think. Should we see if she can fix her technical difficulties and switch over to Jacques? Yeah. Uh, Jacques, you should be live. Excellent. Uh, let, me, let me introduce Jacques because I haven't done that yet. Okay. Uh, if I may, so Jacques Delisle is the director of FPRI's Asia program. He's the Stephen A. Cozen Professor of Law, Professor of Political Science, and Director of the Study Center for the Study of Contemporary China at the University of Pennsylvania down the street. He spent, specializes in Chinese politics and legal reform, U.S.-China relations, cross-strait relations, and China's engagement with the international legal order. Jacques' most recent book is To Get Rich is Glorious, Challenges Facing China's Economic Reform and Opening at 40. I have to say, Jacques, if you think to get rich is glorious, you may not have made the right career choice uh, because academia is not the best route to that, at least as near as I can tell. Uh, Jacques received both a JD and his graduate education in political science at Harvard University. And, and Jacques, over to you, as we hope that we can get Shihoko back if the electrons will cooperate. Uh, sure. Well, I uh, had anticipated uh, starting out by uh, thanking Shahoko for that great overview, and I'm sure we'll get back to it. Um, so I'm going to switch gears from where she was headed and focus mostly on the China side of the story. If we think back to the quaint old days of the before time when we used to talk about the U.S.-China trade war, uh, there's a lot that was going on there that spoke to the issues we're addressing today, which is this question of trade and economic policy and what it means for growth and for geopolitics. And if you think of the gravamen of the U.S. complaint about China's behavior uh, that, that came up most profoundly in the Trump administration but had roots before that, it was essentially a criticism of China for having illiberal economic policies both at home and abroad. And so if you consider the litany of complaints from the Trump administration, most of which had a basis in fact, although they were wrapped in uh, pretty uh, extreme rhetoric and didn't have a clear sense of priorities, nonetheless, it, it, it really is a set of complaints that had some legitimacy to them and that have some deep roots. And I'll just run through uh, some of what they were. Again, it's a list of illiberal economic policies. So one is unfair trade practices, including dumping and subsidies, uh, the kind of thing that led to lots of WTO cases. Um, and it was basically a, a complaint uh, that this was leading to the trade deficit. That's a little misplaced. Uh, the US trade deficit is really a global phenomenon, not a US-China phenomenon. Uh, but there was a sense that China was cheating on those rules. Secondly, China used problematic methods to get hold of valuable intellectual property, the kind of things that's key to today's emerging and high value established industries, uh, the areas, the sectors that China wanted to become a global power in, uh, and ultimately to compete with the US in some of these sectors. And here there were a bunch of methods. They range from the failure to stop piracy of US intellectual property by Chinese entities, uh, to subsidized outbound Chinese foreign investment, uh, to acquire technology, uh, to a, a um, sort of old school uh, kind of theft of intellectual property, which ran the gamut from uh, cultivating human resources who could transfer technology, the kind of thing that's led to some recent prosecutions by the Department of Justice pursuant uh, to its uh, China initiative, uh, that included the diversion of technology from US joint ventures to their partners in China, and it included even the comical, like a Chinese researcher who literally ripped the arm off of Tappy the Robot, uh, a cell phone testing device at a T-Mobile factory uh, in Washington and tried to take it home. And then there's those, in some ways, more, uh, more significant new style kind of theft, the cyber theft, the hacking in uh, to, to, uh, to corporations and their computers uh, to get some fairly valuable intellectual property and that had been uh, the object of a rather ill-fated agreement between Xi Jinping and Barack Obama back under the previous administration. And then there was the much noted coerced transfer of intellectual property. That is, uh, if US companies want access to the Chinese market, they must by contract transfer uh, valuable IP. Uh, and then uh, more broadly, there was large scale Chinese industrial policy, the state picking winners, funding winners, and protecting them from foreign competition in a fairly statist approach to the economy. This was most prominently featured in the so-called Made in China 2025 policy. It's been renamed a little bit in the face of US criticism, but the idea was to make Chinese, China and Chinese firms world leaders in 10 key uh, technology sectors. And lying behind all of that is a sort of state uh, not state dominated, but certainly state steered and state supported economy. For all this illiberalism to work for China and its development strategy, however, it depended on China existing in a basically liberal international economic order. And China had to significantly, but far from completely 
uh, play by those rules. So we all know the reform era story of China's growth through exporting goods uh, to the developed world, through opening its own economy to foreign investment that would transfer technology and know-how. Both of those things have receded some. Now we see China investing in outbound ways to acquire technology. And at a more fundamental level, China was essentially following something like the East Asian model of development, uh, wherein engaging with the outside world, playing by international market rules abroad, while also engaging in, in pretty aggressive industrial policy at home, a sort of state-led role in the economy was, was very much part of the story. And this allowed China to move up the value chain into higher value-added sectors, into uh, areas where it was less dependent on cheap labor, which China no longer has because of cost increases, and that could be done by a somewhat older population that China now has. The problem with um, all of this is that, um, that, that it, this, this mostly uh, liberal international economic order has been coming unstuck. So that environment in which China flourished isn't working so well anymore. Uh, many sources of this, it's been going for a long time, but it really took a big step forward under the Trump administration and the broader American disillusionment with international economic liberalism and a turn toward economic nationalism or economic populism, both on the left and on the right, and blaming China for much of the problem. The basic idea was that the system wasn't working for the US anymore. That's why you see things like the US uh, essentially scuttling the WTO process for dealing with trade disputes. And a key impetus to this idea was the sense that China had succeeded and had closed the gap with the US economically essentially by cheating, by, by taking advantage of the rules without playing by them. And so what happened was the bipartisan consensus in the US for engaging China, for getting China into these rules and institutions and the expectation that it could be socialized into global liberal economic norms was replaced by a frustration that it hadn't worked, China hadn't come around, uh, and that it was taking advantage of the system in ways that were inimical to US interests and, and more threateningly so as China became richer and more powerful. So the bipartisan consensus essentially flipped. Um, and it is fairly telling in this that we therefore saw the trade war with the escalating tariffs and so on. And even more telling in a way is that we entered this period, which would have been strange uh, several years earlier, in which Chinese leaders, Xi Jinping and Premier Li Keqiang, were going to international gatherings and saying, we are here to protect the open liberal international economic order from the backsliding that the US is undertaking. Uh, under Trump and more broadly. There's also, before I close, I want to turn to one more uh, dimension of the story here, uh, which is the, the, uh, the question of where China now is vis-a-vis -vis this liberal order. Yes, there's the rhetoric of supporting it, but there is this long history of a degree of illiberalism at home and abroad. And the question is, is China now essentially going to be ultimately supporting a slightly revised order or be uh, relatively fundamentally uh, illiberal and pushing a China-centered order with different uh, values um, in the economy and to pursue its own uh, geopolitical interests that can be adverse to those of the United States. There are sort of two pieces to this story that evidence we can look at. One is the rise of the so-called China model or the China model of development, something China had been very reluctant to push uh, early in its developmental phases, but under Xi Jinping it's gotten a little more uh, self-confident, a little more willing to say that this model of significant state roles in the economy a managed engagement with the outside world, which doesn't leave countries vulnerable to shocks like we saw in the global financial crisis or that we may be seeing coming out of COVID, and that tolerates a fair amount of political illiberalism. Uh, that's essentially uh, the, the pitch of that model, and it's now being pushed at the very moment when China has adopted a conscious policy of saying, we don't want to just take international rules anymore. We want to shape them and shape them in ways that serve China's interests. The other prong of this is the BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative, the One Belt, One Road set of policies, which are a massive Chinese project to support infrastructure construction and connectivity and markets more generally across mainland Asia and into Europe and across Southeast Asia, maritime Southeast Asia, across the Indian Ocean and to Africa. And the BRI is this uh, sort of unholy melange. It's got a bit of a big infrastructure investment and, and loans guaranteed by uh, sovereign commitments to build big pipelines and railways and highways and ports. It's also an attempt to create and develop markets for Chinese goods abroad and for China to have access to inputs that it needs from abroad. It's also an outlet for the excess capacity of China's construction industries. And it's been kind of a hap haphazard, unholy race to get on board with the maximum leader, Xi Jinping's signature policy, Belt and Road, where every enterprise and every local government wants a piece of it and is repackaging whatever it was going to do anyway 
uh, in terms of the, uh, the big policy of Belt and Road. It's also arguably an attempt to get the kind of economic leverage over foreign governments to get them to cooperate with China's geopolitical agenda, uh, including towing its line on Tibet and Taiwan and any, any uh, friction that it may have with uh, the United States and others. And finally, there's this institutional face, the creation of things like the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, the New Development Bank, the sort of tweaking of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which is kind of an alliance of Eurasian landmass authoritarian regimes, to make that a possible nexus, a possible institutional focus of a Chinese-centered order. But we don't know quite what this is going to mean yet. Partly it's that it's still pretty new and it's pretty complex and pretty fragmented, but it's also partly because the US retreat from support for international institutions and the economic order and the international economy has meant there's a vacuum. And China has therefore acquired an option. It can do things that are dual use. It can do things that aren't clearly status quo supporting or status quo undermining, and we're just not gonna know for a while. And finally, COVID has sort of compounded this. Uh, COVID is in a sense a blow to an open liberal economic international order because it's disrupted those global supply chains. We have decoupling because of the disease and the economic shutdown that is essentially a dream, a dream that Peter Navarro could only hope to pursue uh, and now the disease has made it possible. Uh, and what you see now is the addition of public health reasons and national security reasons for wanting to pursue the decoupling agenda of bringing back onto the US shores the production of certain sensitive goods such as uh, PPE for medical workers, uh, medical supplies and other such things. And the U.S. response to COVID-19, in contrast to the Chinese response, has made the U.S. appear even smaller on the world stage. The reaction is to shut down travel uh, with the Trump administration to blame China and to blame Europe and to blame lower levels of the U.S. government. Uh, well, China has, uh, through some rather clever packaging, I think, put itself in the position of saying, well, never mind that it all started here, partly due to Chinese regulatory failure, and instead to portray itself as a provider of international public goods, starting to ship the masks uh, sometimes on a, a donation basis, exporting the goods that it's always produced that are important to dealing with COVID, and exporting expertise, the experience of having handled the virus in a way that, despite concerns about the accuracy of Chinese reporting, appears to have been relatively successful. So that's my quick overview. I'll stop there and hope we have Shahoko back. I think we do have Shahoko back, and I have good news for Shahoko, which is when you froze, you didn't freeze in this horrible ah kind of kind of face that we all fear. Um, but but when when internet freezes, but you actually look pleasant and nice and wonderful. But before I pass it back to you, Shahoko, I'm just going to say that uh, some of us heard Bob Kaplan, who's an old friend of of FPRI, say that the coronavirus is going to mark the, the, the inflection point between globalization 1.0, when the rules apply, and globalization, global supply chains that, that Jacques was just speaking about were uniformly, pretty uniformly viewed as a positive to sort of a retraction from that and a move toward globalization 2.0, where we see some of the costs and the negatives of globalization. And I'm gonna, and guessing, that Chihoko is gonna talk about some of that as well, as we all pray that her internet holds true for her. Chihoko. Chihoko, we, we can't hear you, but we can see you. John, you're unmuted again as well. Great, yeah, so I, I, I just uh, sent a note to Shoko. I, may, I had this problem myself. I turned off the sound on my computer itself. Uh, so make, make sure that that is up. Mm, nope, do you want to uh, Do you want to try rebooting maybe Shoko and we'll start, we'll go to some questions from Jacques. Okay, we'll see you again in a minute. And, uh, as, as we get a question from Jacques, per, perhaps I can start by asking Jacques the uh, question I just previewed. Jacques, um, what, what's your sense of 
Bob Kaplan's suggestion that we're now going to see the darker side of globalization, he thought possibly for some decades. Eli, can you give Jacques his microphone back? I think, okay, I think we got the mic back. Um, I th you know, Bob Kaplan's a very uh, insightful guy and I agree with a lot of what he has to say. I, I think he's right, we're going to see the dark side of globalization, but I think I would put it, we're gonna see more of the dark side of globalization. I think it was already there. And uh, you know, if you trace the, the origins of the, the turn that I was talking about, um, you know, the, the US started souring on this uh, notion of constructive engagement with China really back in the closing years of the first decade of the new millennium. It really dates to the Obama era and the, and the late Hu Jintao era in China. Um, and the pushback has come from both sides of the aisle in the US. Uh, the sense that, that US economic interests uh, no longer align terribly well with this kind of engagement, this kind of impatience, people looking at the job losses, the closing of the gap and all of that. So that's been building. Obviously, uh, the coronavirus has taken it up a notch because uh, you know, globalization is profoundly threatening uh, in a way that it wasn't before. You can actually die from it, you know, and we, we've had previews of that before, of course, the SARS epidemic that came out of very similar circumstances back in the early 2000s, all the things that gave rise to the warnings about pandemics that appear not to have registered with the U.S. or other governments as, as strongly as they should have, uh, but it makes it much more visceral, uh, and it also underscores the economic side of it. I mean, part of this disruption is is, is policies of, of shutting down, uh, but you know, some of the disruption would have come even if the pandemic had been contained to China because of the disruption to factories and suppliers there. So it, it has underscored and, and sort of uh, put a big exclamation point on the, um, the, the risks that come along with the many, many gains of globalization. And of course, it also means that it will essentially slow the recovery somewhat because we have to get back up not only to level where we can go out in public locally, but we can get back on airplanes uh, and, and that sort of thing. All right, we have a question from Stephen Cohen who asks, will countries that are now being more restrictive about border control have a major impact on China's ability to get international cooperation through the BRI? Um, you know, they're, they're one of the, the big question marks, or one of the, well, not even question mark, one of the aspects of, of COVID-19 that has yet to hit is what happens when it really gets going in the developing world, where the carnage is going to be a lot worse because of the inability to social distance, the lack of healthcare system, the underlying uh, poor health, and so on. Uh, and so that is going to really, I think, make uh, trans-border flows of people uh, a lot tougher, and it's going to cause some disruptions of, of trade. Um, you know, given the arc of things, unless there's a rear option in China, it's going to be much more concerned about uh, people coming into China than Chinese going out to these uh, these states. Uh, there will be Chinese concerns about uh, Chinese going abroad and what that might mean, but that can be handled with uh, quarantine type things. It may well um, escalate the uh, growing doubt in those countries, uh, which, which already has arisen over the terms of Chinese investments in BRI and the dependence on China economically. Uh, you may get the kind of public health and national security concerns uh, that we've seen arising in the US, piggybacking on the longer standing economic concerns, you may see that accelerate in those countries as well. Uh, we have uh, one more question in before we'll try to go back to Shahoko. I see she's back. Um, from Norman Sumner, who asks, is China still the largest creditor hole of the US Treasury notes? And would China be willing to cash in these notes? I haven't checked the numbers recently, but I believe it still is. There's certainly been no uh, significant sell-off. Uh, you know, the, the, the debt trap issue with China's uh, behavior abroad is, I think, exaggerated globally. Um, I don't think there's a conscious debt trap strategy even toward BRI uh, countries. And with the U.S., I mean, the answer to that, I think, is the, the old joke that when you owe your banker a little bit of money, he has a problem. When you owe your banker a lot of, I'm sorry, you owe your banker a little bit of money, you have a problem. When you owe your banker a lot of money, he has a problem. Uh, it, would be, it would be kind of a severe self-inflicted wound for China uh, to start dumping T-bills or even to stop buying them. And in a global economy that's really shaky, you know, U.S. government debt is, is still about as secure an investment as there appears to be, and there's certainly a lot more of it for sale at the moment. Uh -oh. 
Shahoko, are you there? Can you hear us? Yes, I can. Yeah. Okay, great. One more second. I'm just going to spotlight your video and then uh, you can get started again. So sorry about that. Um, but All right, you're um, good to go. Yeah, but ju just to continue on what um, Jacques was saying about um, how China is using this in into its favor that it that the COVID outbreak has actually been, been to its favor um, and certainly this is not America's finest hour when it comes to dealing with the pandemic um, the United States tends to um, pose this as does China in a great um, great power competition framework and so there's a lot of geopolitical rivalry that's being ballyhooed on both sides. Uh, uh, the White House um, in particular has really taken this to uh, be an opportunity to showcase some of America's um, rhetorical strength and to actually uh, push a lot of blame on, on China uh, rightly in, in terms of what the origin of the, uh, of the um, virus is, but also to um, focus on um, uh, to frame this in a way that actually puts it in a strategic competition with the United States. Um, but if we take a step back, um, what's interesting is that for the rest of Asia, this is not seen um, as an opportunity to really kind of go forward with that great power rivalry. That this is actually deflecting from what really needs to be done. And the voice from um, the rest of Asia is that neither China nor the United States is dealing with this right in a way that is attractive for them to actually side with either Beijing or with Washington. And we've seen that too um, with the US-China trade uh, uh, battle as well. Um, the, I just wanna go back to the trade issue. Um, trade volume um, in absolute terms had actually been going down um, as a result in part of the trade tensions between the United States and China. But of course, um, that trade volume had um, been de declining, um, especially um, in investing in China, had been declining because of the decline of the attractiveness of the Chinese market, especially when it comes to uh, labor costs. Places like Malaysia and Mexico are, are actually much cheaper now than, than China is. But the trade war had actually um, been costly not just for China, but it actually was costly for neighboring countries, including US allies um, such as Japan and South Korea. Um, and there's a lot of fear that this um, focus on strategic competition when it comes to COVID as well um, could, lead, uh, to, could actually lead to a lot of negative consequences before there is any real progress. And so um, what we are seeing is that, you know, there aren't, there isn't really a lot of support for Washington when it does go on the offense, um, when it comes to, um, for instance, calling uh, the virus, the, the Wuhan virus or, or the China virus, there's a lot of reluctance to really uh, side with the United States. Similarly, when it came to the trade war, there wasn't a lot of support for US um, pushing back against China, except when the United States was calling for China to adopt fair trade practices. And so that when the United States was pushing for greater um, transparency, um, better um, an, an even playing field, um, protection of intellectual property rights, this is when other, when other countries actually rallied around the United States. So if the United States actually supports um, global incentives such as greater international cooperation when it comes to combating pandemics, when it comes to dealing with things um, that are really becoming problematic on the trade front, which is um, export restrictions, then you will find support for the United States. And unfortunately, we're not seeing a lot of that from the United States at the moment. Um, just one more thing about the um, export restriction issue. Um, right now, we are in a deep freeze for the global economy. Um, about half of the countries of the world are essentially at an economic standstill. And we will see a great divide in how countries are e able to turn back the tap um, when it comes to economic re rebirth and regeneration. 
um, and the developing countries, as Jack said, will be particularly hard hit um, when, um, because, uh, twofold, one, because there is this broad economic slowdown worldwide, but also because when, when and if the pandemic hits their countries, they don't actually have the capacity uh, to deal with it economically or on, on the healthcare front either. Um, we are seeing these um, export restrictions being imposed on the medical front at the moment. So there's a lot of competition for medical equipment. Um, but there's also a lot of export restrictions being introduced on food as well. So you see countries like Vietnam, which is the world's third largest rice producer, already imposing export restrictions in the name of national security. Um, that has great impact on the rice um, procurement of neighboring Southeast Asian countries. Um, you also see this um, in continental Europe as well. Um, you see countries like, um, in Eurasia I should say, um, Kazakhstan um, has limited um, export of flour, sugar, some of other uh, grains as well. Uh, we're seeing Russia um, introducing some trade restrictions, as, um, tr uh, trade export restrictions as well. So in these things, we see it at the individual level, we see a lot of hoarding going on. Um, we can, there is a lot of concern about that kind of export restriction, um, irrational fear um, hurting the global economy. And this is something that the United States could step up um, and be a good actor, um, which wouldn't cost it too much. And yet there is this noted absence um, of US leadership on this front as well. Thank you, uh, Shahoko, for um, pointing out, as Jacques did, that uh, the United States is, many people believe, uh, failing in its global leadership role, passing up even, even pretty simple opportunities at a time of global crisis and providing opportunities for China, as Jacques said, to step up and, and fill that vacuum. One of the interesting things domestically for me, we're seeing the state governors taking uh, a role to fill what, what some people believe is a national leadership vacuum. I'm not seeing the same sort of thing from other important global actors like Japan, who one might think would step up in the, in the absence of American global leadership. What, what role do you see Japan playing in, in the role that the United States traditionally filled? Is there, is there an opportunity for Japan to step up? Um, well, Japan is going through its second phase of um, COVID um, uh, spread. Um, it had been one of the first countries that had been affected by the virus. Um, the Japanese government thought that it had had it under control, but it was only actually um, yesterday that Tokyo decla declared a um, de facto state of emergency in the country. And um, they are actually... Um, taking greater steps to impose um, social distancing and other um, policies that are happening in the United States. Um, what, the, what the Japanese are doing though um, is taking on a great role in ensuring international multilateral cooperation. Um, I'm, I'm sorry I missed um, a good chunk of Jack's presentation but um, and so I don't know if we've already discussed this but for instance, the G20 um, as well as the G7 have come up with statements to ensure that there is greater cooperation on, um, on dealing with COVID. Uh, the cynics would all, of course, say that a statement unto itself does um, very little, especially when there aren't enough um, specifics actually outlined in the G20 statement. Um, that said, um, there is a lot of um, competing interests um, and different political ideology behind the G20, and, and Japan was actually one of the key driving forces that actually led to some kind of uniform stance amongst the G20. Um, when we look further down the line when it comes to trade, um, there will be light at the end of this tunnel. We don't know when exactly um, this will end, but we will see a different sort of globalization emerging we will see a different type of connectivity emerging. And Japan does have that commitment um, to ensure that multilateralism does actually um, prevail. 
And that really is because Japan, for Japan to punch above its weight, it actually needs partners. Um, it needs partners from like-minded countries, and it's in its own national interest to ensure that it can step up to the plate and fill that vacuum that the United States is leaving behind. And I think I'm right that the uh, the G7 statement actually failed because of United States and I, I think specifically Mike Pompeo insistence that it be referred to as the Wuhan virus, yeah. the China virus in the official statement, which the other countries in the G7 wouldn't allow. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm, as I'm exactly. on YouTube, I'm going to go ahead and ask the question. Um, so, so yeah, um, th there is a lot of opportunity for other countries to step up. But what is happening um, is kind of like what happened with TPP. TPP went forward even without the United States. Um, the 10 other countries plus Japan uh, rallied to, to push it down the finish line. Um, perhaps it will expand once COVID um, settles down. But what we do know is that there is clearly um, a, a need, especially in Asia, to um, fill not only the vacuum that the United States is leaving behind, but also to be able to push back against China's authoritarian rule and that there is power and collectivity and that there is going to be this redefinition of ASEAN centrality, uh, a renewed interest in uh, partnering with Southeast Asia in particular. And we, we've got a question that I think works well for both you and Jacques uh, from Steve Cohen. Is China gaining increased power in ASEAN and does it matter? Uh, which one of us do you want to answer that first? You, you go ahead, John. Okay. Um, complicated. I mean, the um, China's relations with ASEAN are are, are um, uh, sort of split in by modal a couple of ways. Uh, one is China has the you know, long-term gains in terms of economic engagement with ASEAN. It's the number one trading partner, hugely important investment partner with most of those states. Um, that has created a degree of wariness about how that kind of economic dependence can be used to political ends. So there have been some hedging and some sort of offshore balancing strategies, particularly on the security side, uh, to offset the, the vulnerability to China that that implies. Uh, Shoko just mentioned ASEAN centrality. ASEAN centrality depends on ASEAN unity uh, and, and has done a fair amount to undermine ASEAN unity. Uh, partly that is driven by the territorial and security disputes in the South China Sea, where several ASEAN states are rival claimants to China and have had fairly uh, heated uh, confrontations. Uh, whereas some other ASEAN states, particularly the poorer ones that border China and are even more economically dependent, um, have been more willing to bend to China's uh, preferences on that particularly contentious set of issues. And the BRI itself has essentially uh, amplified this, this kind of split reaction um, in that it's been a huge source of uh, badly needed and, and in many cases much welcomed investment, uh, but there's also been concern about the terms of it. So you see things like Malaysia under Mahathir, who is amazingly back for another tour of duty after uh, they haven't been in power for decades and then out for a while, uh, who came to power in part because of concerns about corruption in the prior uh, the interim regime, and and in part about the the deals uh, struck with China and BRI. So I think you're really seeing this, this sort of being pulled in both ways. And as Shoko alluded to e earlier, most of the countries in the region don't want to be put to a choice between uh, the U.S. and China, but circumstances are are having them sort of uh, pull on both ways. I think the the net shift in ASEAN very recently has been in in the direction of trying to get its house back in order, so it can be a central player again, and so to sort of regain its balance. Uh, vis a vis China and Japan's been part of that story, partly because the US has not been all that engaged. Um, I, I think that um, you know, countries like Singapore um, have really emerged as a critical American partner. Um, they really, really remain staunchly in support of, of um, Washington's prerogative, and they've also done a really good job of keeping uh, the COVID virus in check. But um, there is, um, you know, a greater divide amongst the ASEAN countries and countries like the Philippines, which should have been a, a staunch supporter of the United States, has not actually uh, been doing so. And we're seeing this greater um, you know, tearing apart of that ASEAN fabric, which will probably only accentuate uh, because there will be this greater divide between the developed um, 
industrialized ASEAN countries versus the uh, more vulnerable um, uh, um, ASEAN countries um, that will be particularly hard hit with the oncoming global economic slowdown. Uh, thank you, Shahoka. Uh, we have a question from Carlos Rivers who asked, is, is the, the, the geopolitical confrontation we're seeing now uh, a, a return to old-fashioned power grabs using COVID as just a pretext. And Choco, you're laughing, which means you get to answer. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I mean, yes and no. I think um, this, there is an opportunity um, to see some good coming out of uh, the COVID issue, or COVID has actually accelerated trends that have already been in existence. And I think that's particularly true in trade. Um, so when we talk about the uh, fragility of the global supply chain, we had already seen that with the US-China trade war. Um, we had already seen companies trying to diversify away from China. We had already seen um, incentives um, for, from Southeast Asia in particular, as well as Taiwan, to encourage um, companies to invest in them and, and leave China behind. Um, so that the, the COVID situation has also highlighted what we have always perceived as strength in, in the supply chain becoming weaknesses. So, um, you know, this whole idea of just-in-time production, this whole idea of having lots of inventories is bad. Uh, we should always pursue something that is the lowest cost possible. These are not necessarily good things, right? So just-in-time production and having low inventory is really great if the distribution side works, but if the logistics aren't in place, if there is a delay, then we have a lot of problems. So we have to reconsider this, that COVID is actually accelerating something that we should have already been doing and we had indeed um, already been taking into, into account. So um, there is the silver lining um, when, it, when it comes to COVID. But again, I am concerned um, about you know, not just the um, slowdown in the traffic of goods and services, but we're seeing also borders, right? So the first thing that um, was shut down was human um, flow. And this has really been very political um, and there is a, a health need to do this. But at the same time, um, oftentimes it has appealed to some of the lowest basest uh, political um, uh, knee-jerk um, fear-driven reactions. And it's also leading to a lot of social change um, and social, social change not for the better. Um, so we, we're still in in the you know uh, trying to deal with this virus, but the consequent the long lasting impact of that um, still has to pan out. If I just add uh, quickly to that, I think there are I wouldn't call the uh, wouldn't regard the COVID virus as sort of being used as a pretext for a great power competition, but I think it's a bit of an accelerant. Um, uh, interdependence is often overrated as a stabilizing factor in geopolitical relations, but it, you know, on balance, it often helps. And to the extent you see this kind of delinking or the sense that interdependence is a vulnerability or even exploitable when a when a country cuts off access to vitally needed goods and that sort of thing, um, you know, that's that's something that tends to intensify political rivalry. Uh, and a lot of the rhetoric that has surrounded this has sounded a little a little Cold War like. Uh, indeed, some really kind of wacky, paranoid uh, views of blaming the other side uh, for unleashing the virus. But even if you, fil if you filter out that stuff, um, you know, the, the Chinese did take umbrage, and understandably so, with the insistence on the Wuhan virus and the Chinese virus in the sense that, that the Trump administration is trying to blame China for a problem in the U.S. that was partly China's doing, but also partly a lack of uh, U.S. adequate response. Uh, and on the, um, on the American side, you know, there are within the administration and certainly among especially conservative Republicans in Congress, this has been seen as a chance to push the agenda that this is a, a dangerous rival and it's sort of given, I think, a little more impetus to some of it. 
emerging uh, hardline anti-China views. Thanks, Chuck. As I as I think about the um, the global supply chain, which which works great until it doesn't, uh, it's sort of like Zoom technology, right? It's fantastic right. until it doesn't, and then all of a sudden <laughs> it's awful. But but there are wonderful things about Zoom, as for instance, uh, Susan Mays can can enter in for all of us and let us know that uh, in the past couple of years, China and Japan have toggled back as the first and second global holders of U.S. Tre US treasuries, each holding about a trillion dollars. I haven't checked her numbers, but I trust her. Uh, that's out of our total of 23 trillion, a number that I expect to rise rapidly over the course of 2020. We have a question from Greg Bloomquist, who is, is particularly interested in the impact of all of this on Taiwan. And maybe we start with Shihoko there. Yeah, well, it's interesting. Um, Taiwan's come out really strong on this um, in, t in two ways. Uh, one, on a practical level, it's done really well in controlling the outbreak. Um, it was, it, it has so much um, social um, as well as economic ties with mainland China, and yet it was able to take on really stringent measures to close its borders uh, to, to China and to really protect its, its people. Um, it's demonstrated that it, it can really use data um, and bureaucratic um, coordination well. Um, if, if you want a mask in, in Taiwan, there is no hoarding. It's basically tied to your, so, to your uh, healthcare ID number. Uh, you can actually see where the masks are and you can actually like get it. Um, they are using information from their mobile phones to keep track of people. If you're infected, the government will make sure that you, they know where you are and that you stay quarantined. And these are draconian measures, but they work. Um, so that's on the healthcare side. On the political front, on the diplomatic front, um, the fact that uh, Taiwan is, a, um, is not recognized as an official country and is not part of the international organizations, including the United Nations, and therefore kept out of the WHO, has been highlighted time and time again. And so if Taiwan wanted to ensure that its voice is heard, that it, it actually is seen um, as a entity that really should be recognized as a um, international player and have a, um, a, a place on in international institutions, then this, this couldn't highlight that need um, better. Yeah, I'd, agree, I'd agree with all that. I'd say a couple of things. Um, one is that what Taiwan demonstrates, along with Singapore, South Korea, and to a degree Hong Kong, is that it was possible to contain this virus without draconian measures of the sort that were adopted on the mainland. Uh, and you know, Taiwan is a vibrant civil rights protecting uh, law governed democracy. It was quite successful. Singapore has many of those traits, South Korea even more so. Um, and so in that sense, this has improved Taiwan's kind of international moral standing. Uh, it also, of course, echoes uh, what we saw with SARS uh, a decade and a half ago, in that Taiwan's big breakthrough in terms of access to UN affiliated organizations came after SARS and largely because of the Chinese mishandling of SARS, the lack of transparency, <laughs> in Taiwan and other frontline areas being hit uh, by that particular uh, epidemic. Uh, and, and so in the wake of that, because China had, had wrong-footed it and particularly in, ex in excluding Taiwan, it really created a basis for getting Taiwan that access as an observer to the World Health Assembly meetings every year from 2008 until Beijing decided to punish Taiwan by excluding it once the Taiwanese voters had the temerity to elect Tsai Ing-wen and now to re-elect it as the so-called pro-independence uh, president uh, in China, uh, in Taiwan rather. Um, I think that the, 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 the danger for Taiwan in this is in part that its place in the global economy is largely through linkage with China in the global supply chain. So as that gets reshuffled, uh, that could go any number of ways for Taiwan. Now, there was an adjustment already in place. Uh, there were concerns about dependence and vulnerability on the mainland that were bringing some manufacturing back onshoring to Taiwan, also as the cost gap closed. And Taiwan was trying very, very hard to uh, to reorient its uh, foreign investment and linkages to Southeast Asia, to South Asia, and other emerging lower cost areas that could substitute for the role that a once less expensive China used to play uh, in, in Taiwan's international economic links uh, and could do it without the political threats that come with it. 
the other piece that's come out of this is this has been part of the story of growing support, particularly in Congress, for US pro-Taiwan policy. So we just saw the Taipei Act, one of the most shameless uh, acronym engineered names of legislation. <laughs> Uh, but basically spelling out Taipei with the Taiwan allies, uh, whatever, improvement enhancement uh, initiative. Um, and basically it calls explicitly on the US government to support Taiwan's observer status in non-states member only organizations, sorry, membership in non-states member only organizations and observer status in the UN affiliated states member only ones. And this is largely a pushback against what's seen as Chinese bullying and squeezing of Taiwan's international space, including kicking it back out of the WHA observer role and poaching about one third of its remaining diplomatic allies in the last four years. Uh, Jacques, uh, stay there because we've got uh, a great question from Thomas Gold uh, that I missed that Eli uh, pointed out to me. And listen carefully, because this question packs an awful lot in a very few words. I would expect no less from Tom. <laughs> do we have a sense, wait for this, do we have a sense of China policy of Biden, Sanders, Pelosi, Cuomo, et cetera? <laughs> yeah, you got it. And, and Biden, Sanders, Pelosi, Cuomo, in that order. Over well, to you. I'm a big fan of etc. policy toward China. I think <laughs> that's recruited many of the best minds in foreign policy. Um, you know, I, I'll, I'll, ta I'll say most about Biden because I think that's probably the most relevant uh, actor here. Um, I think, you know, Biden among the list of, of shall we say, U.S. policy relevant uh, potential leaders going forward um, has been the least likely to depart radically from what we saw in the Obama administration or what a Hillary Clinton policy would have been. Now it's still tougher on China. It is, it is part of that big shift in the center of gravity on US-China policy toward being tougher on China, toward seeing it uh, as more of a geopolitical rival and uh, toward a, a sort of exhaustion of the patience with China socializing to, uh, to global economic norms and, and, and adhering to its obligations. So um, within the spectrum of, of democratic uh, leadership. I think it's, it's, it might be called relatively soft on China, and you've seen Biden toughen his stance over the course of the primaries after some initial things that sounded kind of like greater continuity. Um, so I think you would expect to see really many of the same complaints as raised by the Trump administration, but with a clearer sense of the hierarchy of goals on the economic side. Um, and um, I think with, with Sanders, uh, you would see something that is a little less um, uh, forthcoming toward China, partly because uh, there is a greater degree of economic populism there, a concern about protecting American jobs from losses to China, that sort of thing. Now, again, I think that's you know, not a great fit policy-wise, but I think that's the perspective. Um, uh, Pelosi, you know, her main um, stance on China issues, at least the most publicly visible uh, uh, side, has been more critical of sort of the Chinese political system. Uh, she was uh, she represents uh, Chinatown District in San Francisco and became very early uh, on engaged with the human rights critique in China in 1989. She was one of the leading voices in the attempt to uh, sanction uh, China on the trade front uh, for human rights violations. So that kind of idea that China's political misbehavior uh, should affect our economic engagement with China, I think is something that's fairly deep rooted with her. Uh, Cuomo, I have less of a sense, but I think probably still in the mainstream democratic area. So I think what you'll see if we go to any democratic leader like that post-Trump, you'll see some of the same concerns, probably a clearer sense of hierarchy, and I think less vacillation, less I have a great relationship with Xi Jinping, but the Wuhan virus is killing all of us. Um, so I, I would think greater coherence. Uh, for what it's worth, the, the people around, um, around uh, Biden and um, the other sort of so-called moderate lane Democratic candidates who since dropped out, they're pretty mainstream uh, Democratic China policy, Asia policy, foreign policy types, which is to say not radical departures uh, from what we saw under previous Democratic administrations, but a tougher line just because the nature of the relationship has changed so profoundly. Joko, anything on that? Yeah, just one thing. Um, I think whoever the Democratic um, uh, leader is, well, it'll most likely be Biden, but um, We'll probably see more focus on partnerships as well, find it because um, the United States can't really do it alone. And there would be uh, value in the United States actually joining forces with like-minded countries, especially uh, Japan as well as South Korea. Um, so that's probably the, the trend that we will see that we have not seen at all from the Trump administration. 
Yeah, I'd agree wholeheartedly with that. The, the, the sense we've gone to a trade war without our allies, and I think you'll also see much more engagement with international institutions. There'll still be criticism of the WTO, but there'll be re-engagement. Uh, you know, that kind of thing I think one would expect from any democratic administration. So uh, thank you both for that. We, we're gonna come back now uh, in what may be our last uh, uh, question uh, to, to sort of the, the announced topic, uh, but uh, a really smart question from Moshe Wolf. Uh, assuming a two-year economic recovery period, which uh, I, I think is optimistic, but I'm interested in your thoughts on that, what are the domestic political fractures we could expect to grow within the PRC leadership? What are the domestic implications for China of this? Jacques? Well, um, you know, it, tough to say just yet. I mean, one of the, th you know, there was some buzz that when the, COVID virus first erupted, we were gonna see uh, the, the Chinese communist regime's Chernobyl moment, right? The, the sense that they had covered it up and that it was a, a catastrophic failure of governance. Um, that seemed to me highly exaggerated from the beginning, but there, you know, there, there is a, um, a political impact, a political economic impact uh, that's likely to occur uh, in several ways, all of which make things a little dicey. Uh, one is, of course, even though China is starting to reopen, it's taken a big economic hit from that, and growth was already down. The regime has announced it's sticking with its roughly 6% growth target. That's going to be tough to achieve, uh, partly because the external demand is down, uh, and partly because you can't go back up uh, full speed immediately, and you may have bounces and that sort of thing. Uh, there is some risk that it feeds into a growing narrative that was critical of Xi Jinping for uh, not really being a great crisis manager. Uh, he got a lot of flack for the Hong Kong protests, which got out of hand and, and put China in kind of an ill odor uh, internationally. Um, he got some uh, criticism for uh, the, what was seen as the mishandling of the trade relationship with the US or not understanding how bad it could get and how, how destabilizing that could be uh, for China. Um, and so I think you know, there are those, those kinds of pressures. So he is in some ways vulnerable in the sense that he's somewhat weak. On the other hand, compared to what? And one of the things he's been very able to do is to essentially keep any rival power centers that appears, it's an opaque system, but really appears to keep rival power centers more or less in check. Uh, the big state-owned enterprises are doing pretty well with state support at the moment, uh, and that will likely continue. That gives him one constituency. Uh, and he's made it pretty clear that he's um, willing to be pretty tough and authoritarian. Uh, in dealing with threats, including uh, everything from political dissent to uh, to the coronavirus itself, uh, and if the if the um, uh, initial moves in handling the virus work out as well as at least they now appear to be, it probably in the end buys him some credibility, especially in contrast uh, to what's gone on in some European countries in the United States. Fair point, Jehoka. Yeah, just one um, little thing, um, which is big, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative. It'll be interesting to see how that actually pans out, um, the motivation, the incentive to move forward with it, um, uh, to deal with excess capacity, et cetera. Uh, those um, realities may not necessarily be the case over the next two years, in which case what happens to BRI, what happens uh, to the political uh, unifying factor of the BRI and what, how will that uh, help or hinder Xi's power is something that I would really like um, Jack to answer, but I don't think he has time. <laughs> Thanks for giving me off the hook, Chef. <laughs> <laughs> Dodged a bullet there, Jacques. <laughs> this, this, this whole conversation just points out to me how important foreign policy and, and international security issues are. Uh, we talked a little bit about uh, globalization. I, I, I have to, out of uh, fairness, Peter Crotto pointed out that uh, we, 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 we did criticize the Trump administration for calling this the, the Wuhan virus or the China virus, but did not mention that China uh, blamed the virus on a U.S. military experiment, which is absolutely uh, ridiculous and appalling, but, but does play to, I think it was Jacques who pointed out, sort of the in, in some ways, the resumption of a Cold War between China and the United States just exactly what we don't need at a time when, when uh, I would argue we need the world to cooperate together more closely than ever before. That is, of course, the purpose of the Foreign Policy Research Institute to help find smart ways uh, to, to assist the United States in making good decisions in leading the world for the mutual benefit of all. Um, I, I, I think the technology actually worked really well. I'm really sorry I wasn't able to have everybody over. We weren't able to have a glass of wine together, but maybe we could have 
separately now. I, uh, I do want to remind everybody uh, that Chris Miller is our next speaker on Tuesday, May 12th, 7.30 p.m. Uh, what is Putin thinking? And uh, the, the, um, the return to the Cold War and uh, the questions of um, geopolitical adversarial actions resuming the world that Raleigh Flynn grew up in. And I'm going to throw it back to Raleigh to take us home. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, Jacques and Shahoka, that was fantastic, uh, fascinating, and as, uh, as John pointed out, exceptionally well-timed given what is going on in the world. Um, John, thank you for playing host tonight. Uh, as always, we're, we're very grateful to you. Um, I would also put in a plug for the next program. Chris Miller, if you have not heard him before, is fantastic. Uh, he is a, a program director of our Eurasia program at FBRI and one of the most dynamic and knowledgeable, um, I dare I say, young scholars around. Um, anyway, thank you again for your support. Thank you for, for coming this evening. And I look forward to seeing you, hopefully in person one of these days. But in the meantime, stay well, stay healthy. And thank you again.